Hello, this is Michael Canfield, and thank you for joining us today on The Dog Watch. A dog watch is an evening shift of early or late duty, or the people who undertake it. This dog watch considers the natural world and the things that help us experience it, from dogs to watches and everything in between. Ultimately, it's a place for us to go wherever curiosity takes us. Today on The Dog Watch, we have an opportunity to talk with Tom Bartels, the former and longtime director of the National Association of Watch and Clock Collectors, which runs both the NAWCC Museum and the Library and Research Center in Columbia, PA. Tom has been a member of the NAWCC for 54 years and has lectured throughout the world on clocks and horology. He joins us today from his home in Nevada and discusses clock and watch collecting, shares tips on how to approach making a collection, describes the NAWCC holdings and jewels of their collection, and relates the story of locating the treasured angle clock in the back of a barn. Our feature today is the song, My Grandfather's Clock, that was written by Henry Clay Work in 1876. Tom shares with us that the clock in this song is what led to the general public indiscriminately referring to most large clocks as grandfather clocks after this song became popular, despite the fact that many are technically referred to as tall case clocks. With that, let's turn to the conversation with Tom Bartels. Hello, Tom. Welcome to Dog Watch. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you here, and you're uh, out there in Nevada this morning. What's the temperature like? Well, it's uh, a little brisk in the high 20s, but it's supposed to get up into the mid-60s today, oh, wow. which is way above normal. Yeah, that's pretty warm for this time of year, I guess. So, Well, you probably have a, a nice little perch relative to what we have. It's awfully gray and white here um, and awfully cold, so... I hope you enjoy maybe get outside a little bit as it's harder harder to do for us. Um, so, you know, I really appreciate you being here and talking to us today. You have a lot of uh, information and a wealth of understanding of, you know, horology and clocks and r really decades of experience. So I wanted to be able to talk to you about that. And in that, I wonder if you can help us understand a little bit how it all got started for you. Like, where did you get into clocks and watches and the whole question of horology how did that start well i was about uh, 11 or 12 years old and there was a kid that lived down the block from me who uh, was a very interesting fellow and uh, i went over to his house one day and he had a bunch of mantel clocks old mantel clocks in his basement and he was tinkering with them and I'd never really been around them much. Uh, the family had been into antiques, and we went antiquing most every weekend. But So he didn't have a lot of friends. We didn't go to the same school or anything. He was only about a couple of years older than I was. But uh, the more I hung around him, the more I started to uh, gain an appreciation for, for clocks. And uh, he was a self-taught repairer and he did a lot of things he played he had an old organ pump organ downstairs and he played that all the time just an interesting guy and uh he started hanging out with the family because his parents weren't interested in any of that stuff so uh we started going to uh, uh auctions and and uh sales and joined the local chapter of the National Association of Watch and Clock Collectors, which was a fairly new chapter in Portland. Started learning a lot and meeting a lot of people, going to the chapter meetings, and uh, fortunately uh, some of the older guys took me under their wing and sort of mentored me and uh, started teaching me about what horology was all about and uh, some of the different really fascinating aspects of it and so the more I went along the more I started to appreciate about clocks and watches mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately I became more 
interested in the early American shelf clocks and and clocks like that because there weren't a lot of uh, other clocks in the area at the time. But uh, I should have taken up watches because they were <laughs> they're a lot easier to move around. But they, you know, uh, I have always been a his, uh, history buff and enjoyed studying a lot of uh, areas of of history and every time you look at something major shift in in our culture or our technology clocks and watches seem to be right at the center of things Hmm. Um, because uh, the first actual uh, use of interchangeable parts was uh, from clocks in out of Connecticut made by a gentleman named uh, Eli Terry. And that basically started the Industrial Revolution. And people really don't, you know, other people say, well, there were other examples. Well, the, the idea of interchangeable parts been kicked around and tried to be incorporated in manufacturing for quite a while. And... Uh, but the real useful, uh, you know, direct use of it and, and successfully having mass-produced anything um, what well, wasn't feasible until Terry actually did it and fulfilled what was called the Porter Contract and delivered a thousand Woodworks movements uh, two years after he made a, a, a contract to what was called the Porter Brothers. Uh, who were basically Yankee peddlers. They would, you know, have have their guys uh, get a wagon load of clocks and go around to the different farms and sell them to the farmers and stuff and then come back in the spring and um, collect the money for them. Um, but besides that, it was also, uh, and especially with watches, you know, watches were basically a European... Bailiwick and the American watches didn't really have much of a, uh, of a of a reputation, but gradually uh, th- those shortcomings were overcome, and companies like uh, Elgin and Hamilton and some others really started making great quality watches that eventually surpassed what the Swiss and and the Europeans were doing and doing it cheaper. So uh, that was the sort of thing, you know, that kind of went along the same lines as uh, a lot of other industrial revolution type uh, changes in our society. And, uh, you know, one of the main reasons uh, that England was able to create a huge empire, a worldwide empire, was because of clocks. Uh, The king had put out a huge bonus to anybody that could demonstrate that they could make an accurate clock that could be on a ship uh, that allowed mariners to calculate their position and uh, that was longitude and if you had longitude you, latitude was easy but the longitude was hard so England basically uh, got from Harrison uh, and he it took him a long time before they finally paid his uh, him the money but uh, he finally got it shortly before he died um, and that's, you know, that's the sort of thing that, you know, one little innovation, one one change can have a huge impact on people's everyday lives. And, you know, until the late 1700s, clocks were basically just for the very wealthy. And, and if you had a clock, that was a huge status symbol. And, of course, then all clocks basically were what we call grandfather clocks, but the proper term is actually 
tall case clock because um, grandfather clock would, was never used to describe standing clocks until a song came out called My Grandfather's Clock by Henry <laughs> Word. <laughs> I didn't know that. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Yeah, it's uh, an old song that says, uh, it was about an old man, his grandfather, and he says, and, and I guess the, the main memorable line of that is, and the clock stopped never to run again when the old man died. Um, and since then, basically, they've all been called grandfather clocks. It's kind of funny that, you know, I've been repairing clocks now after leaving the NAWCC for over 20 years and people call everything a grandfather clock if it's a little bit old it's a grandfather clock you know whether it hangs on a wall or it's a shelf clock or whatever so it kind of shows you that people really don't have a clue uh, on on what a clock is and most people you know are clueless on on anything remotely uh, involved in adjusting or fixing it and that sort of thing. Um, but I think, uh, you know, and uh, again, most of my customers are f fairly elderly. Um, I don't think, I think we missed about two whole generations that just can't tell time unless they look at their wristwatch or their phone, you know. Um, don't wear wristwatches anymore, but wristwatches are now coming back as a big status symbol and uh, not because uh, they tell time it's just because they're a status symbol and they look you know look cool yeah so but when you were then a kid right you started kind of learning this repair business on mantle clocks how mm -hmm. how to do that when when would those clocks have been from um, those mantle most clocks? Yeah, most of them were uh, American shelf clocks. You've seen the flat top mantel clocks that are black black mantel clocks. That they made millions and zillions of them. And every company, uh, both in this country and Europe, were, were making a lot of inexpensive clocks that right. were available to the common man. Yeah. And they weren't expensive. I could get... You know, I think that I paid about, well, I, you know, first clock was a couple of model ships, but I paid as little as 10 or $15 for, wow. okay. for some of the earlier clocks. And it's good, I, you know, I could get in and then start tinkering with the clock and completely screw them up and mm. not lose a lot of money. So, <laughs> And so you learned the craft that way, kind of just taking them apart and adjusting them, etc. Well, the beginning, yeah. And then when I was executive director for the uh, National Watch and Clock Museum, which is owned or run by the NAWCC. I had a, an excellent curator and conservator from England who was formally trained, and we set up classes, so I attended the classes and oh, really learned a lot there. Mm -hmm. and NAWCC continues to offer a lot of classes, both for the you know, the, the entry level and the intermediate and the advanced stuff. Right, right. And, okay, so what happened between when you were a kid and, and like, how did you get to be the executive director there at the NAWCC? Like, what, what was that interim and what were you doing with clocks at that, sort of to get you to that position? Well, I, like I said, I grew up in Portland. I, uh, went to the University of Oregon in Eugene and graduated in 71 and uh, my dad was a bank examiner and he and I started a, a, a small bank uh, here in northern Nevada uh, and was planning on being a banker and after about 15 years and the bank did very well um, all the rules were changed as far as uh, being able to buy out a bank or own a certain percentage of stock and all the sharks started coming around and um, the bank was sold uh, and about that time the NAWCC had grown to the point where they needed a full-time executive director both for the museum and the uh, the membership so I thought that was a great 
great timing and I uh, was very fortunate to get that job and uh, did that for 15 years which uh, really proved to be um, you know a, a real benefit and, and, a, and a great learning experience because I mean I traveled all over the world lecturing uh, in well, I lectured in Italy and England and Switzerland and Russia and Australia and basically got to see the world on clocks. Wow. So. Wow. And so you moved to Pennsylvania then? Yeah, to... yeah. The, it's obviously a full-time hands-on job. Right. Um, and but can you explain a little bit? Um, our listeners may or may not know much about the um, NAWCC, and can you explain what the organization kind of is, and and also kind of the museum, like what what the facility is, and and what the organization is for, especially because you know some of them may actually really be encouraged and want to join. So, well, and I encourage anybody that's uh, the least bit interested to look up our website. But the NAWCC was started about. 80 years ago, 40, early 40s, and uh, from a few watch collectors in New York, and it just kind of grew, and, uh, at, well, New York and Boston, they had what that was called the Boston Watch Club, but um, it was incorporated basically as a member organization, non-profit, and didn't have a museum until about 1976 uh, when the association bought a uh, building from uh, that was being sold by the, the utility company in Columbia, PA, which was where the uh, administrator and uh, editor of the uh, magazine lived. And he and a couple of the presidents that came through decided, well, let's let's start and build a, a museum. Mm. And uh, that was the beginning of it. It got off to kind of a rough start because, um, first of all, you know, collectors pr you know, love their stuff, and they don't want to be giving, you know, they don't give it away right. uh, easily. Uh their best stuff anyhow so we started the museum started getting a lot of stuff that were you know <laughs> mistakes let's put it um but eventually uh we got some large donations from uh made some pretty good collections that were given to the museum and uh really got us going on uh putting together a decent story of timekeeping and then at the same time we uh, started building a uh, really extensive library and research center, which is the finest in the world now. It's, you know, basically the uh, the, the library uh, to go to if you want to do research on any aspect of not just clocks or watches, but also uh, makers and uh, um, different advancements and and that sort of thing so you know everybody sort of gets their own field their own area of expertise right and you learn when you have an organization like that you learn who has the expertise in which area and so you have these walking libraries and a lot of the information uh, that these guys got from a lifetime of study and, and research uh, were uh, an invaluable resource and I learned a lot from from these people but it became apparent that they're not going to be around forever and they realized it so they're more uh, these guys were a lot more willing to share their knowledge than they were their stuff but um, uh, the research center now uh, is the pride and and the collection uh, are the pride of the association mm -hmm. and um, it, it shows that there's been a commitment from 
way back that uh, you know the the mission of the association is to share knowledge and expertise and um, provide a, a, a medium to where uh, people can get together and share information and learn from each other. So we have a, a lot of, we used to have, a, you know, before the plague, uh, a lot of conventions all over the country that were run by local chapters. And at one time we had, you know, over 35,000 active members and about 15 to 17 conventions every year, plus the big national convention, which would move around. And then also a, a couple of major seminars on, on specific subjects. So uh, there was a lot that was offered and is still offered uh, by, you know, for people who, who want to learn. And, uh, you know, it, it's easy to think, well, these guys are a bunch of, you know, old white farts that are <laughs> this closed society that doesn't, you know, want any outside interference and that's that couldn't be further from the truth yeah. you know these uh, some of the most fascinating people i've ever met and become friends with in my life were clock and watch people uh which included you know the guy that invented the microwave oven and oh, wow. uh, uh doctors and lawyers and uh people who you know shared the same interests and they came from all these different fields that I, w if it hadn't have been for this uh, common interest, I would have never met these yeah. people or got to know them or made friends with them or learned all the stuff yeah. I learned from them. So Yeah, and as far as the association goes, so you have, there's a magazine which is put out and you can subscribe either um, digitally or you can get the print copy, which looks, you know, it's quite beautiful. Um, there's yeah, the, I I have a complete <laughs> a complete set of <laughs> our our magazine yeah, which fills up a whole room now really. But wow. uh, the wife is not happy about that. <laughs> but I do refer you know I I I refer back to them all the time, and we have you know uh, an index where you can uh, access off of the website right and, yeah say oh yeah i haven't seen that label before and look it up and get all the information that's ever been printed over this you know 75 year history right and it seems so. like so you know that's an aspect we'll talk about the collection a little bit because i have obviously have some questions on that and sure um, the, i'm curious about you know also the research collections which you talked about which i think is something that you said is sort of the pride and joy and behind the scenes has mm -hmm. an incredible wealth of information and um, you know, members especially can um, do research there, et cetera. You know, I'm curious about your experience in the collection. And, I, you know, I'm just as an example, I'm interested in like how people keep notebooks and how people write things down. And I've been curious about um, how watchmakers do that and whether watchmakers or watch companies, the people working in watch companies kept like written records or like drawings or things like that are those kinds of things in the collection or what kinds oh, of things? A, absolutely yeah. we have we have the account books from some of the earliest makers in this country and in europe that go back to uh early 1700s oh wow and not only the the account books we have all the account books and and records from the hamilton watch company which really? was a huge watch company oh, wow. I mean, uh, and several other watch companies, and uh, people access and use that information all the time in writing uh, articles. Um, and and by the way, all the articles that are submitted for publication, uh, we don't pay for; they're all donated. And uh, you know that's that's kind of the trademark of of our association that. Um, you know, uh, it, things have morphed and changed a lot since I was a kid, and there were a bunch, a lot more members. Things like eBay and the internet. I mean, when I first came on as executive director, we didn't even have a website. That was in you know mid '80s, so websites were a new deal. So we 
started building that when shortly after I came on board with the help of a lot of volunteers who were a lot more computer savvy than I am and uh, that has grown into a huge I don't know if you've seen the yeah, website or absolutely, yep. gone through it but it's it's a huge resource with all kinds of information and you know even a virtual tour of the museum but uh, <clears throat> Yeah, I mean we've we've managed to survive with all these changes and um, and obviously we don't, haven't been able to maintain the high level of membership that we did before. But you know our members are 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 pretty loyal and um, have been on board for a long time. I've been a member now for 54 years. So, uh, yeah, I, I joined when I was... And I went to meetings and stuff several years before I actually became a card-carrying member because I, <laughs> I was just a kid, you know? Yeah. Mm. But um, I have a lot of memories from the early days. Like I said, I spent a lot of weekends in basements of some of my mentors uh, learning about clocks instead of chasing girls like I should have been. But um, that was you know, just kept feeding the fire as far as the interest goes because they had all the good stuff uh, that you don't see out in the normal marketplace. And uh, you learn things about, well, okay, this is a good clock, but it's had a lot of restoration done to it. And, and you have to, you know, learn it one step at a time. But there was a lot of fun, too. I mean, I told you, we used to go to... Um, auctions <clears throat> there was one very prominent auction that would bring in containers of stuff from Europe with a lot of clocks and this friend that I told you about who I got my first clock from would go hitch a ride with us to the to the auctions and I remember one story where he borrowed some money from my dad on the way to the auction because he was broke he always paid his bills, you know, if he borrowed money, he'd always pay it back. But So he borrowed some money from my dad, we went to the auction, my dad started bidding on a clock, and there was only one bidder against him, and he turned around to see who was bidding against him, and it was <laughs> that guy. <laughs> bidding with his, his money, and he drove him over there, you know. I'll tell you, that was an interesting ride home. Yeah, I'd say so. Yeah. That was funny. Um. So, obviously, also, it seems like part of the online presence of that community, the the NAWCC community, is, seems like a pretty active group, especially in answering questions and talking with each other about the specifics. Is that true? I mean, it seems like there's a yeah, lot going on. Yeah, we have right? uh, f forums, what we call yep. the forums, on every kind of subject regarding clocks and watches you can, you can imagine. Everything from uh, early pocket watches to tower clocks, which weigh tons, to and there's guys that collect tower clocks, believe it or not. <laughs> and I know a guy with eight tower clocks in his living room. Wow. There's no room to walk around. But, um, and even things like uh, reverse painting on glass, which was commonly used in a lot of clocks, and uh, labels and on the clocks, all kinds of things. Yeah. Um, plus more esoteric areas too. But yeah. Uh, yeah, if you have any interest in just look up that particular thing and, and join, if you're a member and then join, you know, ask a question and you'll yeah. get a lot of responses from very knowledgeable people. Right. That's something I've noticed is that the quality of the response and the depth of the knowledge is pretty remarkable, right? These are the people who know the clocks and the watches and the parts and and have done yeah, I, you can find a lot of stuff on the internet, but you're not going to find it all in one place, and you're not going to find people that are willing to share their knowledge and stuff for free all the time um, and bring you along and give you pointers or head you in another direction if right. they don't have all the answers. Yeah. So let's just turn a little bit to the collection at the um, museum. I, I want to obviously talk about the Engel clock a little bit in that story, but I, I also wanted to ask you about some of the other things at the museum, like some of the other prizes that you have, things that are really important. 
you know, I saw in the virtual tour um, on the website, you know, you have the the zipper gave bo from bo the Bonaparte family, the Bond wristwatches. It sounds like there's some a display on the descendants of the Harrisons, and s et cetera. And I'm just curious if, yep. if there are one or two things that you're like, these are real, along with the angle clock, which is kind of iconic for the museum now. But like, what are, what are a couple other ones that you feel like are really important? Well, we, we have had some, been very fortunate that some, we've received some entire collections, uh, including from a couple of my mentors from Portland. Um, one donated over 450 clocks plus his whole library um, years ago. Uh, we've had, we've got one incredible clock made by Pierre Jacques Droz, who was very famous in, in uh, France and all over Europe uh, for making automatons. Uh, and he would get used music that was specifically written for uh, uh, this huge, beautiful organ clock, and uh, it's a one of a kind. And you can see how much you know detail and art and just craftsmanship that you, is unbelievable into building some of this stuff. And it's there, and, and I, I had it set up in, a, in its own case with a recording of, of the organ as, as it plays, and also you just push a button and you can hear exactly what what the music is uh, plays on that clock. And we have uh, some incredibly complicated watches uh, from uh, Long and Son, uh, from like you said, Breguet. Breguet was probably, is considered uh, the most brilliant and, and f prolific watchmaker of all time. And he was from the 1700s. And uh, he invented things like the self-winding watch. He called it the, the Perpetuelle. And we had that. Um, we have uh, a lot of early American tall cases made by some of the best uh, makers, well-known makers, uh, from all over the colonies and from the early U.S. Uh, very fortunate to, to have such a, an extensive collection of tall cases. And uh, we have had in the past several special exhibits where uh, one, I did a special exhibit on early American tall cases and wound up getting all of the premier best known masterpieces of early American clock making in one room, which had never been done before, including from uh, Rittenhouse and uh, other makers who, you know, these were their masterpieces. And I got them from very famous museums, uh, the, the Wadsworth Athenaeum, the uh, Smithsonian, uh, all of them. Uh, people, you know, realize that, you know, to have all of these in one place and do a special publication about them uh, would be a, a real benefit. So, so I owned, I was able to go in and sit in, in the special exhibit room and look at this collection and say, you know, I own the best clocks that ever made in this country. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. You also told me, I think that, um, and here's where the terminology gets, you know, you have to be careful there. You were talking about tall clocks. There's also the tower clock that you told me that you installed that was from the sanatorium or something where, where uh, Ulysses S. Grant was. So what, what was that about again? Well, I wanted to build a tower, a tower clock. You know, I mean, the first clocks really ever made were tower clocks. They would go up in the steeples of uh, the church or a public building, and the word clock is, is a derivative of glocken, which means bell in Dutch. And <clears throat> that's all they did initially. They didn't have hands or a dial or anything. They just rang a bell at the hour. 
so people walking in town would know when it was 10 o'clock or noon or whatever. And they were very large, and they were usually made out of cast iron and, and, and later, you know, brass and stuff, but they certainly weren't portable. But those were the earliest mechanical clocks, and those date from the well, mid-early 1600s. Um, people don't realize how much, you know, is involved in that. I just saw where they're just now finishing up a complete restoration of Big Ben. And uh, Big Ben really isn't the clock. Big Ben is the bell in the tower. And that was made in, 18, in the 1860s, the clock was. And the bells were cast. And the first bell broke. Uh, and trying to get a huge bell like that up in the tower was uh, <clears throat> quite a, a, a chore. But... Um, one of my tours that I led, we got special permission to go up in the tower, uh, which is not easy to do. Very few people get to go up in the tower and actually see the clock operate. And you stand right next to the bell, and I swear the fillings in my teeth rattled when that <laughs> thing went off if you're standing next to it. How big is it? Like, is it like big as you? Big as Oh, it's, it's huge. Really? It's huge. It's, uh, the, the you know, the, the rim at the bottom of the bell has got to be eight feet across. Oh, my God. And it, it is just massive. And the hammer that hits it is like the biggest sledgehammer you've ever seen in your life. Oh, my God. Um, wow. And the funny thing about that is that they, they regulate it a little, just tiny bit, a little from, you know, winter to summer because... Things like temperature and barometric pressure and that slightly affect the accuracy. Okay. And they put English pennies on top of the pendulum to regulate the time. So if it runs a little slow, you take a penny off the top of the pendulum. If it runs a little fast, you put a penny on top of the pe pendulum. <laughs> really? They've been, and they've been doing that for 150 years. <laughs> and it works, I guess. Yeah, Yeah, it works great. Yeah. Um, That's funny. But... Uh, after seeing some of the great tower clocks in Europe, I, I, I came up with the idea of, so, well, what if we had a, a tower clock, but since we're an educational thing, I want people to see how the dang thing works without having to try to crawl up the top of a tower. You know, and there's always bird droppings and God knows what else up in those things. So uh, I started kicking the idea around of building a tower with the movement on the ground level and with windows around it and they could see how everything works the bells would still be up in the top of the tower but you don't need to see a bell work and uh, the, the idea caught on we had I had a great architect who did the architecture for the new museum and the school across the street and we came up with a design that uh, I was really happy with, and uh, it's unique as far as tower clocks go because you can see everything from the ground level, and it's a beautiful tower. Um, but we had to design the rewinding of the weights, uh, the all of the gear transfers that went from the tower all the way up to the dials, and uh, everybody sort of pitched in and uh, put it together. And we got the uh, movement, which was uh, is a Howard movement, and it was donated by the state of New York, along with the bells, because they had a an old tower uh, on a shutdown, um, oh, what do they call them, when, when you'd go somewhere for recuperation. Yeah, sanit a sanitarium, okay. Sanitarium, yeah. So, uh, which the sanitarium in Upper New York State um, stopped, which, by the way, was where Ulysses Grant died. Um, they closed the sanitarium and turned it into a prison. <laughs> mm. So they didn't need the tower clock anymore. Right. 
uh, and they donated that, and uh, we were able to uh, get the tower clock chapter. There's a whole chapter just for tower clocks, and they got it out of the old tower and brought it to Columbia, and we completely refurbished it and rebuilt it. Unfortunately, when they were getting it out of the uh, tower in New York, the uh, cable broke and it dropped about 15 feet. <laughs> oh my God! Wow. Which you know, I it was that was kind of a disaster, but uh, we were going to re completely rebuild it anyhow. Yeah. So fantastic! Wow. <clears throat> so, um, so you did that, and you got the you know the tower clock working, et cetera. One of the things that seems very interesting in a couple of the different stories you've told me and, and we'll talk about in a minute with Engel Clock is that when your um, organization members, et cetera, found, for example, the Tower Clock or the Engel Clock, often, you know, an organization would find something of great value, right? Like a one of a kind thing. And mm -hmm. they would consult and they would hire some outside engineering company or whatever to and they'd raise money to get the experts to do it it's interesting because it seems like you and the nawcc were the experts right the people who had the knowledge to be able to do those things oh. to retrofit it yeah it was all in-house and volunteer which allowed you probably to do those things where i mean the cost of that expertise would never you'd never be able yeah, to afford. Yeah, even right? if you had the money to do it with, you wouldn't have had the people that could could have done it. Right. And so no amount of money would have been able to completely restore that clock. Uh, and I had heard about the clock virtually from the time I first came on board. I'd seen some uh, car, uh, postcards and some flyers showing this massive, massive clock with these people standing looking up at it, and and it was had a huge uh, history of from all over the west, the east coast. Right. Uh, this is it the would, angle. It would, the angle clock. This right. is the angle clock. Right. Yeah, and. And people were saying, well, where is it now? Nobody knew. And there was even uh, uh, some people from the Smithsonian said, you know, we're looking for it. Uh, several people were looking for it. And then one day I got a call from one of our members that said, you know, there's this guy in Connecticut who owns a circus and says he owns the, the angle clock and that he'd be willing to sell it. Um, so it's kind of random. <laughs> there you go. Uh, yeah. I tracked the guy down and talked to him, and he says, "Yeah, I got it." I, I first I was very skeptical. I didn't think you know he had really the whole angle clock because from the pictures and everything, this thing was just absolutely massive. And uh, so I talked to him, and he convinced me that he had the the clock. Right. So we got I had no money then for acquisitions but I did have promises from some of our members that they would help and and chapters so I uh, we rented a U-Haul and drove up to Connecticut and found this farm out in the country with all kinds of weird critters running around, a giraffe and a zebra and emus and stuff like that. <laughs> and there was a big barn. And he came out and he says, well, it's in the barn. We went in the barn. And here is this pile of rubble in the corner of the barn that had rodents living in it and was all in pieces and some of the figures had been basically eaten uh, and it was about one quarter the size <laughs> of the even if as I envisioned it if it was all put together it was like a fifth of the size of the of, that was shown in the pictures so, I mean, in other words, that they they were completely misleading as far as, uh, unless they used people that were like two feet tall, looking up at this clock, and 
I was starting to get a little hesitant because the guy wanted a, you know, quite a bit of money. But uh, I negotiated what I think was a fair price, and he agreed to it and gave me six months to pay it off. And I said, okay. So we packed the clock up and took it to Pennsylvania. And uh, I started going to the chapters and put a slide program together and said, look, we got this thing. It's a famous clock. It's really cool, but I need money and I need help. And nobody turned me down. All of the chapters, in fact, I had it, the thing paid off from chapter donations in 60 days. And then uh, nobody turned me down to do any of the gold, you know, any of the restoration, which included gold leafing and, and refinishing, rebuilding all the movements. There's several movements in, in the clock. Can you briefly describe what the clock is? It was supposedly styled after the clock in um, in Europe, the big, um, I forget which cathedral, but one of the big cathedral clocks that had a procession of the uh, apostles and a few other dioramas and things that on the hour it would strike and these figures would go around and tell a story and play music. <clears throat> So this was uh, supposedly something that um, would rival uh, the great clocks of Europe in the cathedrals that, that did all this stuff. But it was, uh, and it was, the guy that made it was basically a dentist. He wasn't really a clockmaker. And he was from upper Pennsylvania, upper state, uh, in the Scranton area. And... Um, so he supposedly started building this clock, and it took him years and years. And certain areas where he was supposed to be making these wonderful complications to show the uh, position of the stars and the moon and, and celestial computations and all this stuff was way, way over his head. So basically, he made these nice dials and stuff, and then nothing was behind them. <laughs> Even the calendar had a little slot that you pulled out, and there was a set of cards that went from 1 to 31, and you just put the right card in front <laughs> on the day that it was supposed to be. But it did have uh, uh, figures that moved in, around, including the apostles, and uh, a Civil War, or uh, excuse me, a... Revolutionary War Battle of, of Monmouth, which uh, the, the legend goes that Molly Pitcher, who was a gal bringing water to uh, the guys at uh, shooting the, the artillery, uh, and it was a, on a very hot day, and when one uh, battery got knocked out she took the place of one of the guys and was firing the cannons i don't know how i don't know if any of that's true but that whole scene uh, diorama is worked out on one of the towers um you've got uh, the devil that popped out and you've got um uh, you know certain things that mm, not really historically accurate but entertaining and and it for years and years, uh, it went from fairs and, and uh, special showings all over the country uh, and charging, what, 10 cents, 25 cents to see it. Yeah. And they would have, you know, the whole operation. You'd come in, they'd set a crowd in there, and then they'd run through all the different uh, things that it does. It was a great... Uh, project because um, it brought a lot of people into the museum that hadn't really been involved in it before uh, uh, and it generated a ton of publicity one of our members also you know tipped off the uh, uh, Associated Press and they picked it up and wrote a letter and it got circulated to all of the newspapers in the country 
So they, and we, I was even on Good Morning America. I got my 15 <laughs> minutes of fame by saying Good Morning America. Wow. Oh, that's um, awesome. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. We were uh, pictured on, on the cover of the New York Times Sunday magazine and, and all that good stuff. So generated a ton of interest and publicity, uh, even though a lot of the purists who were our members uh, poo-pooed the whole thing as kind of a sham and not really that horological. But uh, eventually everybody sort of came around because it's, you know, let's face it, that's the main entertaining thing that people have heard about and want to see it work. And, and you know, that's I, I think it's great. Yeah. So. so tell me a little bit more from a layperson's perspective. Like why... Why would someone who knows a lot about clocks poo-poo it? Like, what is the actual clock? You said there are a couple movements. Like, what is the what are the inner workings that you had to restore, and why aren't they really horologically significant? Well, there's let's see, one, two, three, four weight-driven movements. They're all not even spring-driven. So you got this big cabinet on the ba- on the base, which basically holds all these big weights. And the design of each of the movements was sort of copied off of other types of clocks. There wasn't anything really unique or uh, that was original as far as the design or the mm-hmm. construction goes. Uh, and like I said, a lot of the, the really supposedly highfalutin uh, functions and dials and things had absolutely no mechanism at all be, to run them. Uh, he just gave up. So, I mean, they would, you know, would never tell you that when they were having show, giving their big show and having people pay a quarter, and then if they'd realize that, they, hey, wait a minute, you know, there's nothing. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it is what it is. And, and uh, I really put our museum on the map initially. And it's a great story and icon, and it's quirky. And I mm-hmm. think also the story of you finding it in the barn and then pulling so many people together to fix the the um, little figures, to fix the clock movement, to the the musical aspects. Like it's a neat r- a rallying point, and then um, that can kind of anchor some of the other things that are in the museum, like a research collection, which is again the horological value right of the yeah. museum etc like isn't going to like some kids that come into the museum aren't going to be like oh my gosh some great documents <laughs> you know they look those the devil popping out those two little devils and it's sure it's in you know it's engaging no, it, it's a say. lot of fun and yeah. it does and uh one of the greatest things about the whole thing was that there were boxes two or three big boxes of uh, postcards and and little brochures that they would sell when they you know went to these circuses and, and fairs and stuff and we sold those in the gift shop and within a year or two we got cleared more than three times what I paid for the whole clock by just <laughs> selling the postcards. Wow. That's awesome. Seems like a really uh, important moment for the museum and the and the organization itself. So. Yeah, I, I haven't seen it in person yet, but I have to. I think this summer I'm going to try to get out there and see it. And oh, absolutely! Yeah, you, I'm sure time. you enjoy it. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, we are currently working on redoing uh, some of. It got kind of sidetracked because of the plague, but uh, we are redoing several of the exhibits, uh, including one on public timekeeping, which again is tower clocks and street clocks. Um, we've got a, a marvelous uh, Seth Thomas four dial in the f- in front of the building, which a you know, big street clock. Plus, we have the tower uh, and a couple of other outside public clocks. So now we're doing w- a, a nice, really well done uh, exhibit of public co- timekeeping uh, in the museum itself. Awesome! Wow, that's great. It'll be fun to see. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I I want to be uh, you know respectful of time here, but I have one more question for you, just sure. to kind of ask. And so, there are a lot of guides and et cetera of like people who want to buy watches on the internet or get into watch collecting, pocket watch collecting, et cetera. But let I wonder since I have you here, 
if any of the listeners are saying, hey, you know, I've actually thought, you know, maybe I'd like to get a clock, right? A mantle clock or mm-hmm. kind of get into clock making or, you know, get one and start um, seeing about that. We have you here. How, how would you advise uh, someone who is just like, hey, I'm going to, you know, kind of want to look at stuff, but I don't, you know, I I did a little practice, right? I looked on sort of mm-hmm. eBay around at, and websites, et cetera. And it's it's kind of baffling to know what's junk and where you would start. There are all these like sure. cast iron clocks that look like they weigh 100 pounds. You know, well, and, some of them do. So where would you kind of advise someone to sort of get into it, where to look and what, what kinds of things to look for? Um, because there's such a vast um, difference. Well, and and there's some real pitfalls too that you can fall into by buying stuff on eBay, uh, because you're not going to get full disclosure on on the condition and what restoration's been done on anything. Uh, And some stuff looks great, and then you get it, and you know it. It's unfortunate that we're not having as many of the regional conventions that we used to because that would be the in you know the best place to learn because our people are all members that sell stuff at those shows and they have a very strict uh code of ethics and you know and and everybody lives by it and it's written into all of our you know memory you can get thrown out if you misrepresent a clock or sell a reproduction as a real thing and it's been done uh, so we are very, very strict on being able to give a precise, accurate description of the piece, what it is, what's, you know, rep, uh, what restoration's been done. And what I suggest people do is do a little homework, uh, look around, uh, Go through the museum, either even if you can't be there in person, you can do it virtually, and and see all these things because, uh, you know, everybody's got their own taste and clocks uh, incorporate art and technology and all these different aspects that some people are are you know, drawn to, and some say, well, I don't, don't want one of those in my house, but uh, you'll find something that, that looks like that, and then do some research on it, do a little homework, uh, ask somebody on the forum about these clocks, uh, Where to, where's the best place to get them if you can't go to one of our shows, uh, where, what, what kind of prices, you know, price range should they bring, um, so it, you know, if you do your homework and you ask people the right questions, uh, then you'll be you'll have the confidence in knowing that hey, I didn't get hung up on this thing, uh, and I like what I got, and this you know was able to to track down and and say okay, this is what I wanted to get, and it can be a shelf clock, it, it can be a wall clock, it, you know. Uh, it could be American, it could be English, it could be Europe, you know, uh, Swiss. Watches uh, are, uh, you know, a whole separate area, but it, you, you use the same rules and, um, and, and, and ways to find out how these will fit in. If you want to buy a pocket watch, what kind of pocket watch do you want? Or pocket watches, you know? Uh, right now, wristwatches are, are the hot item. That that's a whole different ball game. That's that's just developed since eBay and uh, these other things have have changed things because people aren't buying wristwatches, and we're talking about new wristwatches here. There's a lot of makers out there making very expensive watches, um, and not just Rolex. But I'm sure everybody has heard that you know. The Chinese can make stuff that you would not believe as far as knockoffs go. And uh, you have to be very, very careful. Deal with uh, people with good reputations and are knowledgeable. Um, I wouldn't suggest starting out with a high-end wristwatch right now until you did some homework with some cheaper stuff. You know, one of the methods that... I have always used 
in collecting is you add to the top and you sell off the bottom because there's always people coming in in the entry level that you know you're going to sell but you know i not having an unlimited budget uh and limited space and a wife who says no more clocks uh you have to be selective and there are certain pieces that uh, you know I've always drooled over, but I would have to sell two or three or four clocks, you know, to get the one I wanted. And uh, so it's you know n vast numbers. Some guys go crazy and buy everything that can s that crosses them, and wind up with four or five hundred clocks in their house that not only don't work right, but aren't worth a lot of money. You know, it's to my mind, it's better to have a few pieces that you really appreciate that are you know are in good condition, and you know the the provenance on them, and um, I get much more satisfaction and enjoyment from those than I would from 150 alarm clocks. Although there are people who collect nothing but alarm clocks, so. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, uh, uh, yeah, that's an interesting thing. I think people can go down all sorts of different little uh, rabbit holes. Yeah, yeah up, everybody's but... got their own little niche. Yeah, that's good advice, though. I think especially now with the advent of technology, eBay, Google, all these things, yeah. people often try to get into these things, um, and myself included, right? You sort of look out there, see what's there. Um, but for horology and especially clocks and watches, it seems like, um, both once there are, you know, gatherings starting up again, and uh, but also just the resources available through the NAWCC seems like a, a good place mm -hmm. to start. Mm -hmm. And to because also people, once you're a member, you can ask questions, you can talk to them, and then you learn a lot, right? Then you know what you're dealing with rather well, than just absolutely. buying and, random and stuff. And, you know, if you are fortunate enough to go to, say, our... Uh, uh, national convention, which will be held in Dayton, Ohio this year, and it's in June or July. It's easily found on our website. There are all kinds of little workshops, lectures, and things like that, other than just the main, sh you know, mart room where you can go in and buy and sell stuff. So, and you've got the people there who are knowledgeable and been collecting this stuff all their lives or for many, many decades and are willing to share their knowledge. And uh, so, you know, if you're anywhere around Dayton, Ohio, or can get there, uh, that would be the best learning experience that I can uh, suggest. There's other shows scheduled for uh, Texas on the 4th of March. Um, there's Phoenix in, I think, March or April. And one coming up in Portland, Oregon. So we have, you know, still have a few, not not like we used to have, uh, but I think it's starting to come back. And as far as I'm concerned, you know, unless you can touch and smell and really inspect a piece personally, you don't know what you're buying. And you get on eBay and you can get burned really bad. And I've, you hear all these horror stories uh, of people buying stuff that is misrepresented or whatever. There's, you know, e eBay has got some means of rectifying that, but it's it's a pain. And, uh, you know, you got to smell a clock. you got to get in it and look at it. And, and that's to me is is a, a large part of the of the fun uh, and and getting part of the story and the provenance from the guy that you're buying it from uh, some of these pieces that I have have really interesting fascinating provenances that tell a huge part of the story and you don't get that from buying stuff on eBay or somewhere else online well, you have really given us a lot to think about and a lot of both practical knowledge stories about the Engel clock picking up that clock in the barn. And, you know, that's <laughs> speaking of a, an incredible story, but there's so many others. Right. And I think you're right. 
part of it's about the human interaction. And I really appreciate you taking some time to speak with me and, and give that to our listeners. So, Tom, thank you so much for being on the Dog Watch today. Oh, it's been my pleasure. I enjoyed doing it. Thanks again to Tom for spending time with us today on the Dog Watch and providing such a wide-ranging perspective on horology. Don't forget to write a short review of the Dog Watch on Apple Podcasts and to subscribe as it helps us get the word out to other listeners. Our music credit today is Whiskey on the Mississippi by Kevin McLeod, courtesy of Creative Commons. Until our next shift together, this is Michael Canfield thanking you for joining us on the Dog Watch.